Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 7 will be our text. We'll begin with verse 3. This is God's word. He was despised and rejected by men, man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come to study your word, we come to you. We come to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We come to you who breathed out your word through your prophets and your apostles. We thank you that your word is alive. We thank you that your word is active and sharper than any double-edged sword. Teach us. Shape us. Work in our hearts by the power of your spirit that we might be people after your own heart. We ask in Jesus' holy name, amen. Hey, wait a minute. Where's the baby Jesus? Where are the angels? Where are the shepherds? Where are the wise men? Christmas is about a baby, right? It is, but it's more than that. Because often in Advent, we just focus on the coming of the Lord Jesus. We come, we focus on the Advent, on the incarnation. We focus on the first part of Jesus' life. And how amazing that is. How wonderful that is. We shouldn't minimize the fact that Christ came that God himself, the second person of the Trinity, took on a human nature and came as a baby. But during Advent, sometimes we can just focus on that. And so this year what we wanted to do is something a little bit different, to be reminded of the whole of Jesus' life the goal of why he came in the first place. So today we continue to walk through this passage on the suffering servant. And notice here the gospel comes through powerfully to us. Jesus' whole earthly life from birth to death in so many ways is here. In anticipation of the cross, what Jesus, the suffering servant, has done for us. So we look at these verses, I want us to think in terms of being reminded that it's the Lord himself who has laid our sin on his suffering servant and has healed us through him so we rejoice with humble thanksgiving and worship for this great salvation that he's given to us. Isaiah has shown us in this picture 
of God's suffering servant as Isaiah wrote what God gave to him, probably not really understanding what he's really writing down, a picture of the coming of Christ. And Nicholas, in the last couple of weeks, has opened this, these verses up to us from chapter 52, verse 13 through, through 53, 3. But today we look at verses 4 to 6 to shift from seeing the suffering servant for who he is today to look at what he has done for our sake. First, I want you to notice, as we look at these verses, it's the Lord's suffering servant who has carried our brokenness. Verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. That word surely, grammatically, is an adversative. It sets off these verses to something a little different than what we just looked at. We have seen a picture of the suffering servant, and now there's a bit of a shift to what he has done. Surely, he has done these things for us. It's a sharp contrast from verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. The he, surely he, is actually emphatic. It's powerful the way that the Lord articulates this to us. He is the one who has borne, he has carried our sicknesses. It's another way we could translate that word. Uh, it can include the idea of an incurable disease and our pains, our sorrows. He has carried these things. And that verb gives the idea of carrying a heavy load, a burden that's extremely difficult to carry. That's what he's done. He's carried our sicknesses, our diseases, all the weight of our fallen, sinful lives. He has carried for us. And the expectation of our attitude for him doing this would be thanksgiving, rejoicing, humility. Yet, we esteemed him not. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We considered that he was struck by God, under the wrath of God, someone from whom you stay away. Don't look at him. Don't talk to him. Don't have anything to do with him. He's under the curse of God. He's been abandoned. He might even be hated by God. Probably for all of us, there are times we feel like nobody really understands what we're going through. It might be that they don't understand the burden that we have to carry. They might not understand how hard something is for us. They might not understand that we have a difficult decision that we have to make. People who deal with chronic pain, we often just don't get what that's like. And sometimes when people go through difficult circumstances, they can feel like we're judging them. But just take an aspirin, you'll be okay. You'll get over it. Or the great Christian answer, just pray about it. Sometimes things are really hard. What Christ endured for us 
left to ourselves, we judge him. We see him as cut off. Well-intentioned. Foolish. But well-intentioned. People think in terms like insurance agents sometimes. Horrific tor tornadoes. I didn't wake up. The winds were really strong Friday night, right? Many of you woke up. I sleep through anything. I think I could sleep through a nuclear disaster, but who knows? I didn't wake up but they were, the winds were loud. But in Kentucky, it was devastation. Tornadoes ripped through that state and people think of it as an act of God. Wrong. It's an act of man. Let me explain. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, now thorns and thistles will grow. God created a perfect world, and we destroy it. It's not an act of God. It's an act of sinful man that storms that destroy things have come. Think of Romans 8, earth groans to be redeemed from the bondage that it's been placed under. See, our sin extends beyond just the little things we do. And I say that facetiously. We do wicked things. Sin goes beyond that. It goes to our nature, it goes to our core. We are rebellious sinners. And left to ourselves, we destroy stuff. And Christ has borne our sin and the effects of our sin in his body on the cross. He has carried our brokenness our sickness, our pains, the whole range of fallen human significance and existence in a fallen, broken world. He carries those things. And yet we considered him stricken. We blamed him rather than ourselves. Isn't it easy to find where everybody else is wrong? If only they were more like me, right? Wouldn't the world be so much better if everybody was like us? We see everybody else's sin easily. Brothers and sisters, kids, easy to see what the other kids are doing that's wrong, right? really hard to see our own problems. And sometimes when mom and dad expose those to us, it's like, what? You gotta be kidding me. True for all of us. Notice verse five, 
an intensification from verse 4. The Lord's suffering servant was pierced for our transgressions. The SV uses the word wounded. The original word carries with it more of an idea of being pierced and can often mean being pierced to the point of death. Wound is good. I think pierced is stronger, and some translations use that word. He was pierced for our transgressions, our sins. This word for sin, it's against God, and it carries a deeper sense. We move from verse 4 into verse 5 to drive home what he has done for us. He was crushed for our iniquities. And those two words really carry that full range, the idea of sin. There are other words that we can find that are used for sin, but these words carry the, the idea of the depth of our need for God. This word for being crushed can also mean being broken to pieces. Kids, have you ever seen a piece of glass that just shatters? Sometimes you drop something and it, it breaks, right? And it's not no big deal. The pieces are, you know, manageable. But sometimes something shatters. And there are these little glass shards everywhere. You know, for us, if something breaks like that, we got to keep the dog out of the kitchen, you know? And we're going to have to clean the whole thing up. And you see this little glint of something. This word carries with it the idea that what Christ bore for us was devastating. It was like being shattered to a million little pieces. And so often, we take our sin lightly. We expect forgiveness. We expect God's forgiveness. We expect the forgiveness of other people. We take our sin lightly. Let me just remind us, God never takes our sin lightly, any of it. Because he's a holy, righteous God. He does not take our sin lightly. We often act as though sin's no big deal. It doesn't really matter. So it was a big deal. Jesus becomes the wrath bearer. He carries the wrath of the triune God on himself. And these verses point us to that reality. Look at verse 6. The Lord has laid on his suffering servant our iniquity. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Kind of a shift from the servant to us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've erred. We've wandered off. We've lived self-centered lives, completely oblivious to anything other than our own satisfaction and comfort. We've turned away from God's path to our own. And Yahweh, 
the God of heaven and earth, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our guilt, our shame, our sin, our selfishness, our wickedness, our little mistakes, our white lies, everything. All our sin, all our guilt, God the Father has laid on the Lord Jesus, the suffering servant, for our sake. Maybe this verse, verse 6, in a sense, brings home and brings out the picture of the sacrificial system. This idea of laying on this sheep, this one who became like us but wasn't really like us in that he was without sin. And he took our sin upon himself. These verses talk to us about the substitutionary atonement. That what Christ has done on the cross is he takes the sin of his people upon himself. That just as the Jew would go to temple and they would put their hands on the lamb that was to be sacrificed and then it would be put to death before them. So the Lord Jesus takes our sin. Our sin is transferred to him, to all of us who trust in him, who have put our faith, our confidence, our hope in the Lord Jesus Every one of our sins is transferred to him, and he takes it away. And notice from Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. I want you to remember that. We know this. But these verses from Isaiah bring them out to us, I think, in a powerful way. Because let's be honest. From our perspective, theologically, we recognize the depravity of man. We know that we're sinners. We know that we really need God, and we know that we're really pretty bad. But then as soon as we move from our theological perspective and we go back to regular life, you know, I'm really pretty good. I'm not so bad. We can very quickly forget we were God's enemies, people who left to ourselves would hate God. We would have no interest in the kingdom of God. We would be unwilling, left to ourselves to put ourselves under the lordship of Christ. I can take it from here. Isn't that even sometimes a Christian perspective? Thanks, God. Thanks for the salvation. I can take it from here. No, we can't. We never get over our need for Christ. We were enemies. We hated God. Now, maybe we were more indifferent. I learned growing up as a kid, as the oldest of four kids, hatred can be really a strong thing. When you get really angry at somebody, maybe you still love them, but you get really angry. That can be strong. But you know the way to get under the skin of your younger brothers and sisters? Ignore them. So some of us 
would have been happy just to ignore God. And some of us have. We were his enemies. And that's when God reconciled us to himself. God has laid on his servant our, all our iniquity. And Christ becomes the sacrificial lamb so that in the last part of verse 5, it's by his stripes that we are healed. Verse 5. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. It is the chastisement that leads to our peace. The payment for our guilt was upon him. He was crushed under the weight of our sin. We think about the baby Jesus, and we think about the angels, and we think about the manger, and we think about all the wonderful things about Christmas, if we forget that it's under the weight of our sin that he came, then we kind of forget the gospel. Maybe we think about the wonderful love of God, but we're only thinking about half. Well, okay, honest, not even half because of what he did for us on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sin by being chastised for it, and he is the one who brings us peace with God. It's by his stripes, by the blows that he suffered that we're healed. And it's not so much from physical issues, it's from being under the weight of the reality of our sin the payment what Christ did for us. These verses bring out for us a powerful drama, a real drama, not, not a play. But I want you to notice the drama between God the Father and his suffering servant. This is often called the covenant of redemption. Now in Sunday school, we're going to look at this in the next few weeks, I think. Here we have a picture of God the Father and God the Son agreeing to rescue us and the Holy Spirit involved here as well. But we see prominently the Father and the Son. The covenant of redemption is behind the covenant of grace. And here Isaiah shows us this beautiful picture of God and his servant, his suffering servant who comes to give his life for us. It's a picture of God's love for us through his servant, demonstrating what he does for us in salvation. This, this time of year is wonderful. T tonight we're going to have a Christmas program. I have no idea what it's going to be like. It's going to be a lot of fun, I'm sure of it. And there'll be all kinds of wonderful things that will happen, and we will love it. And tonight, as we watched that program, we'll have some people that will be directing the program. We'll have some people that will be participating in the program. And there'll be some people that will be watching the program. And tonight, that, that'll be wonderful. When we move into understanding the gospel, we have God the Father and God the Son who are orchestrating our salvation. 
And we have those of us who are recipients of what God has done because by his grace, we have recognized our sin, our need for Christ, and we have turned from ourselves to the living God. We have recognized, I need this great salvation. I am lost in myself. These verses are wonderful to read in English. They drive home to us the depth of what God has done for us. I'm sure John's with me. I wish we could teach you Hebrew. Oh, I wish I could tell you what the Lord has shown me in his word. I'm inadequate. The beauty, the power, the majesty of what these verses say to us about God's servant. And for every one of us who are here, we're in one of two places. We're either a part of the kingdom of God, or we're somebody who's watching it from a distance, someone who's an onlooker, someone who observes. My hope, my prayer, is that as you look at these verses, the Lord, by the power of his spirit, will open the eyes of your heart to see Jesus. To see that the only hope you have is to put your confidence in Christ Jesus alone. And to want with us that he would take your sin upon himself. That that's what you would want, that would be your desire. And that by the power of his spirit, you would put your faith and trust in him today. For those of us who trust in Jesus, sometimes we take our salvation really lightly. We become accustomed to his grace. We're okay just knowing what we know. My desire for us is that in this life we will never be satisfied in the sense that I know God well enough, that my hope will be, my prayer will be, that by the work of his spirit, as Paul prays for the church in Ephesus, that we will know him better, that he will continue to open the eyes of our hearts, that we will know his grace and mercy, and that that will be a way of life. I want us to really desire to know the living God because he sent his suffering servant to take our sicknesses, our brokenness, our griefs, and our sorrows upon himself. It is by our transgressions that he was pierced for our sake. Even though all we like sheep have gone astray, even though every one of us has turned to his own way, God the Father has laid on God the Son the iniquity of us all, and we are set free from the bondage of sin and death so that now we have peace with the living God. Charlie Brown, that's why Jesus came. Let's pray.
Father, open our hearts. Open the eyes of our hearts that we will see you more clearly than we have ever seen you before. Overwhelm us with the beauty, the power, the magnificence of your love. Continue to work in our hearts that we will never, ever be the same again because we have met with you. And you work constantly in our hearts and lives. Teach us by your spirit and power. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Our